Well, hello everybody and welcome back to Practice Makes Faithful. Today it is season three, episode nine. We have a great episode ahead of us. Just kick you off this brand new series called I Will Love. We'll dive into that in just a minute. But for now, my name is Ben Patterson and I'm joined by Paul Hugobart. Yeah, uh, we're here, Ben. I feel like we were just in this room re- recording a podcast like two days ago, maybe? Uh, three days ago? Is yeah, that- yeah. Is there it does, a it does feel like it. It feels like it. Yeah, we have a little different schedule today, and hence today's episode is going to be a little bit different. That's right. But we're actually recording on a Thursday, and we are recording before you've preached the message. That's this right. This has never been, done, never before done before in practice makes faithful history. It's true. It's a first. That's true. So welcome to... Why uh, are we yeah. doing that, Paul? Um, so next week, um, I will be headed to the Exponential Conference in Orlando. I will be uh, one of the communica- communicators going along with uh, the Renew and Discipleship.org Exponential? Crews. Okay, yes. Uh, Exponential is a large, in fact, they like to say it's the largest church multiplication conference on the face of the earth. Okay. <laughs> so it's probably true. Somewhere yeah. between six and 7,000 people will uh, go down to the city of Orlando to be a part of this uh, large conference focused primarily on things like church planting and then uh, teaching existing churches how to become multiplying congregations. So disciples okay. who make disciples and churches who plant churches. You know, okay. So that's, that's really at the heart of uh, what Exponential is about. This year uh, in particular, um, the, the theme is, is interesting. It's actually called Lost Cause, Reviving Evangelism. And so the idea is basically to take what has become a, a semi, I think they even use the language taboo, mm-hmm. uh, a somewhat almost dirty word in some uh, church circles because um, either we hate the idea of doing evangelism or people hate the idea of being evangelized. I mean, it's, you know, on both sides of the, uh, the coin, it, it's not the, the prettiest picture when we think mm-hmm. about this word mm-hmm. evangelism. And so they want to get back using, I think, Luke 19.10, uh, which is definitely one of my favorite verses, thinking about the mission of Jesus and what he saw himself doing, coming, seeking to save the lost, mm-hmm. as certainly being part of his, his mission. Certainly we know we came, he came to also uh, become the enthroned king, but part of what he came to do was seek and save lost people. You know, um, So it's, it's hard sometimes to talk about people in that sense. We're uncomfortable as Christians talking about people being lost. Um, and certainly I think people don't appreciate that, that language when we use that language uh, about them, you know, the idea of being lost. And so, um, but there is, uh, there is the need maybe to revive the cause of evangelism uh, within churches. We need to become mm-hmm. disciple-making churches mm-hmm. again. We need to care about lost people deeply. We need to understand and see them as lost, but do that in a healthy way. We've talked about that before on the podcast as well. You know, maybe redefining what we mean lost, not in such a judgmental sense where we just think about lost people as those people who are obviously going to hell and so they're not worth our time, Mm -hmm. which is sometimes Mm -hmm. what we think about in the sense of lostness, as opposed to looking at people the way that Jesus did when he saw a crowd of lost people who looked like sheep without a shepherd and it moved him instead of to judgment in that moment moved him to compassion. We ought to be those same kind of people that move or rallied to compassion for the sake of those who uh, don't have a relationship with Jesus, who mm-hmm. often mm-hmm. don't know their way in this world, although they're trying all sorts of different things. Uh, if we believe we know the way, the truth, and the life, we ought to come back to that. And certainly, uh, really uh, good timing for what we'll be talking about in this series. Yes, There's no doubt about that. And so I'm excited to be a part here. of this conference and, and to get to go and share because this is what we want to do and be here at Grace Chapel, coming together with so many others who want to do and be that same kind of thing, be about multiplication, church planting, disciples making disciples, um, and really for the right reasons. You know, that's the what when we think about it. What do we want to be about? We Mm -hmm. want to be about Mm -hmm. disciples who make disciples. Why? Because we have a deep love for people. We don't even need to put the the qualifier lost in front of that. Why do we love lost people? Because we love all people. Mm -hmm. That's why Mm -hmm. we love lost people. And maybe lost people get a special slice of the, the, the compassion that we're capable of within our hearts. Yep. Um, because we know what it's like to wander um, and maybe not know direction, not uh, be lost, not finding direction and vision and purpose in your life. Mm-hmm. And we want to help people mm-hmm. rediscover that. You know, there are so many studies. We've talked about this, you know, on the podcast, but so many studies and so many of the podcasts I listen to are talking about currently um, 
just the, the struggle that young people are having currently. But it's, when I say young people, it's people all the way up to my generation, Gen X in particular, really struggling for meaning, purpose, and value in life. Have no idea what life is about. And just bouncing from one thing to the next, going unfulfilled over and over and over again. That's what we understand is, is lostness in a sense, or at least part of lostness. Certainly, mm -hmm. yes, there's a separation from God. God wants to bring them back to Him. But as well, man, don't, don't we want people to know what life is really all about? What, I mean, Jesus said, I came to bring these people I love real, true, abundant life. Yeah. And yeah. I want them to live that life to the full. Yeah. So we should be about that as well, is helping people find true life in Jesus Christ and knowing it can't be found anywhere else. So that really, when we talk about evangelism, we ought to get to that place where we say, mm -hmm. that's what's at the core and the heart of evangelism. So mm -hmm. that's where I'll be this week. I'll be there yes. all the way. I think uh, I leave right after preaching on Sunday morning mm -hmm. um, and we'll return sometime late, uh, you know, God willing, Thursday evening. Okay. So it'll be, it'll be a full week of, of that. So you'll be there when this is released, more yes. importantly, when we typically record. Yes. Hence, we're recording on Thursday. Yeah. And because of that, the podcast is going to be a little bit different today than yeah, what it typically is, uh, because you've not preached that sermon yet. And if yes. you're anything like me, your message probably isn't 100% done on Thursday afternoon. It's close. It's close, but it's, it's close. not quite That's there. good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so, um, but we didn't want to skip this week. Yeah, because that's right. This is an important thing that we're going into for the month of March that yes. we've alluded to. And that thing is our missions month. Yes. Um, so it's pretty cool that you're going to be going to speak at a uh, conference focused on yeah. evangelism That's at right. a time where we're going into our missions month, which obviously is largely connected to evangelism. Yes, yes. evangelizing um, the world, evangelizing our neighborhoods, yeah. all of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Let me, let me ask you actually first, before we dive into that, if people are interested in Exponential, in kind of what you're previewing there and what you're going to be talking about, yes. is there any way where folks can follow along with that other okay. than, you know, come on down to Orlando yeah, on Monday? Actually, the only thing um, you could do uh, at this point in time, so the tickets are sold out. And it's, okay. I mean, it's wild. It, you know, ex I, my understanding is Exponential hasn't sold out since before the pandemic. Wow, so yeah. there could be some of the fact that we're now kind of past, you know, at least the pandemic phase of COVID. And so that is bringing people back. But I also do think it is the topic of evangelism and reviving mm -hmm. evangelism mm -hmm. that is bringing people to Orlando. So they actually sent out a message a couple of weeks ago saying, if you still want to follow this, you can follow much of what we're going to be doing, all the main stage stuff. And I think maybe even some breakouts potentially um, on an online platform, but that is actually the only way that anybody can connect with what's happening. Okay. Are those available afterwards to watch? Um, they, I don't know the answer to that question, to okay. be honest with you. I, I, last year, I know all the sessions that I was a part of, I was able to get get a hold of and copies of. Um, okay. And then they uh, were either published on, all those I think were on the discipleship.org podcast, uh, which I think is called Disciple Makers Podcast. And then um, so uh, this year I'll be doing stuff in a Renew track, and all I would imagine a lot of that will be uh, later on the Renew podcast if we if we have the rights to that. So I think gotcha. that's probably okay. will. So we did with discipleship.org last year. So um, yeah, I mean, really, we'll be talking again about um, you know a lot of the work that I've done is centered on understanding what makes disciple making movements so unique. Where. Mm -hmm. Uh, where multiplication is really happening. And it's mm -hmm. not just all, I mean, we're beyond, and, and there's sometimes a difference between disciple-making movements, when we're talking about language, disciple-making movements and church planting movements. And I think really what's at the heart of that is what do we value most or what do we think really needs to happen? We need to be planting churches or we need to be making disciples. Um, and maybe sometimes getting that question, you know, do, do disciples make disciples who then come together and make churches or should we go plant churches and then churches help make disciples? And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that will be a debate that continues to go on for, for a time. Um, but, but whatever it is in those movements, they often value a collective set of what we've distilled, eight principles. We've talked about that before mm -hmm. on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So I will be going down there and engaging in conversations um, about those eight principles, about disciple-making movements uh, worldwide, especially in yeah. the Global South. And then especially this time around, too, uh, I'll be pairing with Bobby Harrington, who uh, is, you know, who's thought a lot about church planting. And so we, we'll be talking about launching new church plants, even though I'm not a church planter. That, that's, not, that's not me. That's him. Mm -hmm. I like to think about the principles, but how can, 
How could a church planter take those principles and from square one incorporate those into the life and DNA of the church and oh, therefore uh-huh. set the tone instead of what I like to try to do I, you know, is, is to take a church that is and bring those principles in and slow cultural transformation. What about establishing that at the front end? So that will be a lot of what is, okay. is being yeah. done at Exponential this year, what I'm part of anyway. And I believe so. we we spent some time back in November. We discussed those mm-hmm. eight principles on one of our podcasts right. that yeah. we can you got a good uh, we can link to that okay. in our show notes yeah. if you're interested in checking that out and miss that episode. Yep. Um, so let's talk about Missions Month. Yeah. Missions Month is something we do at Grace yes. Chapel that we uh, we haven't done quite in the same way we did in the past for a couple of years, yeah. but we are we're bringing back. Um, so. Yes. What is Missions Month? What are what are we what are we doing this month for the month of March? Okay, this so start? Missions Month has, yeah, has been in the month of March for some time, or mm-hmm. it was for some time. Um, obviously, you know, if we go back to March of 2020, yes. <laughs> what happened in March of 2020 yes. that might have derailed some <laughs> somebody's plans somewhere? I don't know. What could that have been? And so, um, yeah, you know, and I, I don't mean to be flippant about the, the pandemic, obviously, just kind of saying we, we know what happened in, in March of 2020. Um, and then, uh, you know, so out of that, we actually committed, even in, in spite of not being able to have Missions Month or this particular Mission Sunday, and we'll talk about that. We actually, as part of Missions Month, we do one Sunday where we call people to give, our folks here at Grace Chapel, we're asking folks to really extend themselves financially and give five times as much as they would give in a typical month offering to give that in one month. Mm-hmm. I mean that, or in one week, I'm sorry, in one week. So five times as much as they would give in a typical week to give that in one month. Um, our folks have rallied to that cause over and over again. And, and you know, multiple times we've raised well more than $100,000 to support some different um, mission efforts. Now, we embrace a mission Sunday as part of a missions month because a number of years ago there was an elder here who said, hey, what if we, what if we operated on, 50, on a budget on 51 weeks? We didn't go on 52 weeks. We, we looked at the year and we said, well, we can navigate our own budget on 51 weeks and then take one week per year that we dedicated and all the offering that was given that day would go to missions, mm-hmm. um, to international missions. That goes back to probably somewhere around 2005-ish maybe. Mm-hmm. You know, so for you know, 18 years plus, uh, Grace Chapel has been um, either operating on that principle in some way, shape, or fashion, um, having a missions month that you know, pushed us that direction, um, you know, something along those lines. And so, uh, you know, we, we have used these finances, these funds that are raised on that Sunday to support work in India, where mm-hmm, the gospel mm-hmm. has been spreading through the work that we have been able to support through the years. Um, you know, they're having to, because, uh, because of the changing political climate in India, move to a much more disciple-making strategy, you know, mm-hmm. to teach disciples to be disciple-makers. And so they've embraced a strategy to do that and are working on training currently right now, actively training disciple-makers to go do the work of disciple-making instead of leaning more into a, let's, let's train some preachers, let's hope we can have church buildings. I mean, it, you know, we sometimes, you know, I, I know it probably induces some trauma to think back to uh, it does for me. I mean, like right now, like I had just like this moment of anxiety, <laughs> thinking back to that moment where we realized we can't meet in our church building, you know, yeah. going back to the pandemic yeah. and then it becoming more real and more real in that period, stretching and stretching and stretching. And we were starting to wonder, okay, well, how do we still do the work of the church? Well, in India, they're, they're having to ask that question all the time. I mean, it is, it is the question that they're having to deal with because church buildings, you know, the government has made it so difficult for Christians to operate in an organized fashion in mm-hmm. India that they're having to move to a solely disciple making strategy or a movement mm-hmm. type mm-hmm. strategy. And so even the folks that we have supported uh, who very much leaned into one model have shifted to another model. And so um, we want to help continue to support what they're doing, especially as they're moving to a, a deeply disciple making movement or disciple making rooted strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, then. In, uh, in Mexico, we've supported work. Uh, we, we are still the sole supporter of a work in Mexico called Kairos. Um, a missionary there named Victorino Calderon who has really moved to a church planting strategy. 
Um, we've talked about this before. You know, we had him here on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit after that. Um, you know, training church planters who are going and pl actively planting churches. And I can't remember the exact number. It was like 11 over the last five years that have been planted. That number is probably old by now because I know more planters were being planted and there was the expectation of planting, you know, maybe five or six more churches um, in Mexico and then into other areas of Latin America by the, I think, by the time this year was finished anyway. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, the work that we're supporting, it is deeply rooted in disciple making, church planting, movement of the gospel, establishing presences within communities that bless communities. You know, think about the work in India that is certainly, um, there's, a, there's a, you know, a very significant good works element at play in that. How can we care for uh, these leper communities who have been abandoned by the rest mm -hmm, of society? Mm -hmm. You know, in Mexico, very true as well. How, can we provide um, medical mission um, or, or medical clinics, really? It's, it is mission for sure, but it's, can we provide medical clinics in certain areas of society that, you know, where, where there are people who receive almost no medical care whatsoever? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but a lot of times those are launch pads for then sharing the gospel yeah, and the yeah. good news of Jesus and, you know, showing people that there's a, you know, that there are other people who care. And so... Well, let, yeah. me, let me ask you specifically, why? Because uh, I think some pushback that maybe I've heard in the past about, like, international missions uh, that I've yeah. heard from folks is, why, why are we doing international missions when there's plenty of people yes. who need to hear the gospel here in the United States? Yeah. That, why are, we, why are we doing this? Why are we doing international specifically? Yeah, I mean, I can definitely understand the pushback uh, because what is being exposed at times is, a, I mean, a, a reality that ought to be that ought to bother us. It ought to mm. bother us that we are not doing in our communities what we are supporting overseas at times. Mm. You know, and maybe it, it's because sometimes, well, we don't have a leper community here. We don't have a leper col colony here, mm -hmm. and we don't have right here, especially in Forsyth County. Maybe um, you know. One, there probably would be a whole lot of barriers to doing sort of free medical clinics here. Uh, in our area, there's a lot of red tape and it would make it difficult. So what you can do in some places you can't necessarily do here, but that doesn't mean there aren't loads of opportunities here. And so I think people who say that, um, I hope what they're not saying is we shouldn't do what we're doing overseas. I hope what they're saying is we, we should be doing things here as well to reach and engage mm -hmm. our communities for the sake of gospel movement, for the sake of, be, sake of being disciples who make disciples, for the sake of um, allowing the church to truly be the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus, doing the same kind of things that Jesus would do if he were living his life in our place. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think what is difficult, and we've talked about this before, when we've taken people on short-term mission trips, it's like they come alive there. Mm -hmm. And then they come back here and they slip like right back into the routine of life. And sometimes they'll even remark, I just don't understand why I can be like that when I'm, you know, on a youth trip in New Orleans, mm -hmm. on a um, mission trip. Here we go to uh, Cozumel, Mexico, uh, to engage with, uh, with what, is, what is a children's home but an orphanage mm -hmm. there. Um, and then also the Kairos work in Mexico, mm -hmm. the work that we used to be able to go and travel to in India, which we can't do anymore mm -hmm. for, for uh, reasons of restriction. Um, and I, I definitely, I feel that tension. You know, I, I can think about, um, I mean, funny, it's funny, even with the, with, um, here, here's a really funny story, not I say funny, an awkward story from my life in that sense. You know, when, when we were in Florida, we began an engagement with uh, a church in uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico. We, uh, you know, it was like we became like they were our second church family. It, mm -hmm. And we were going and engaging with them. We were supporting them financially and other things, too. And um, when we were there, we could walk into dangerous neighborhoods. I'm talking like dangerous stuff that, you know, sometimes there would be parents that would give us pushback to. I can't believe you took my kids to that place. Like, okay, I, I understand that. Um, but spreading the gospel is not safe. Jesus did not say, 
say, come, come and do this stuff with me and it's always going to be safe. Now, I'm, I don't mean to minimize an obligation that we have, especially to young people and to minors, to do the best we can to keep people safe. But we also need to be teaching our kids. I mean, we talked about that with the idea of uh, vocational discipleship and disciple making, that our children need to see how this is deeply rooted in their real lives and why being a disciple maker and a disciple of Jesus is an everyday thing. And so if we're not teaching them through experience that we live this out wherever we go, um, then we're actually maybe pushing people toward a comfortable Christian life instead of the adventurous and yes, sometimes dangerous mm -hmm. life of being mm -hmm. a disciple and a disciple maker. And so, you know, but we'd go in these neighborhoods and our kids would just pop to life, you know? And here I was, you know, I mean, my Spanish is, eh, you know, I mean, it, it was better then. And so I would go and I would just start speaking boldly with people, you know, being only functional in Spanish, struggling for words and having to talk around concepts. And I would speak boldly about Jesus to folks in these projects. I would even come back to the United States and where we were in Florida, lots of folks who spoke Spanish, and I would speak boldly in Spanish, and then I wouldn't speak boldly in English. Huh. So it was this strange, like almost like segmented reality of my life. I'll be a disciple maker like this and when I'm yeah, here, but yeah. when I'm here, I won't be. Um, and, and that, for some reason, is a phenomenon that lots of us who've been on short-term mission trips experience. Hopefully what it does is it creates a hunger. So, so back to that original question, Oh, I would yeah, at least say, uh, yes, we should be doing it here too. Mm -hmm. And yes, we should be doing it there. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not a one or the other. It's both of these things absolutely should be happening. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Man, a couple, a couple pieces to respond to in that. I think um, I, I like that. I like how you handled that of the, the both. I think that's one side of questions that people may have mm -hmm. about doing international mission trips. I do think, I mean, I have heard, and not even necessarily from our church family, but I've heard pushback from people who wonder, why do we even do, like, why are we going over to do that? Why doesn't the church in India support their yes. own yeah. work? And to, to me, I just think we we live in a country of such such wealth, yeah, such, such wealth extravagant yes, yes. wealth, right? Mm -hmm. That um, in comparison yes. to the, just the, GDP of our country in comparison to what some other nations are, what the average income is for individual mm -hmm. people here that to mu who much has been given, much will be, much required, will be required, right? Yep. And that we would all agree that our yep. faith is a global movement, right? It's not mm -hmm. a American-centric right. thing yes. to where going out into other nations is so, so critical. Um, and I think that's basically the heart in why we do international missions in general. Yes. And then I love the point that you added, and yet that's also not an excuse to not do it here. That because, mm -hmm. oh, because we're doing it over there, we don't do it here, that no, that's not at all what it's about, that we need to be doing both ends. Yeah. Again, too, I would, I would say, too, to the people who, uh, because there is a going and there's a supporting component to what we mm -hmm. even, uh, how we engage internationally. You know, the supporting piece, we know that is significant because the, the finances that we send from here, I mean, it's amazing how, I think, how ignorant, and I mean that in a kind way or gracious way, how ignorant many people are to how much one dollar can do somewhere else on this planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, to where one dollar here, if you drop a dollar bill, you may or may not actually stop and pick it up. If you drop a dime anymore, you're probably just letting it roll. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we are. Yet our one dollar can go quite far in some places, or if you take a thousand dollars, or, you know, just hearing, hearing recently an example, um, you know, I believe it was in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, here, if you were to have somebody who was working full time with a church, I don't know how much would that cost to support somebody like that? A minimum of fifty thousand dollars here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, what might cost fifty thousand dollars here in the United States? We could take that same fifty thousand dollars and spread it like three or four ways and support three or four different located you know, evangelists, preachers, ministers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with within, you know, several different churches at that point in time, yeah. you know, and so um, it doesn't mean we don't do what we do here. And it doesn't mean that my work and yeah. your work and yeah. the work of every, you know, everyday ordinary disciples is not incredibly important here. It is. 
we're saying yes to all of it. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so there is that there is that supporting piece. Then on the flip side of the doing and or the going piece, um, man, I think we sometimes minimize the impact we can have in one week or two weeks sometimes when we choose to say we'll leave our area and go somewhere. But that even that is two sided. You know, I think about it should be almost impossible to build the kind of bonds we built with that church in Puerto Rico by engaging with them one to two weeks out of the year, depending on who was going, what mm -hmm. trips we were taking, when we were taking those trips. It should be nearly impossible. Yet the relationships, the depth of relationships we built with those folks through the power yeah. of Jesus Christ were so rich they were our second church family. Yeah. And I know that is true for folks here who go to Cozumel, Mexico and work with Ciudad de Angeles. Uh, that is true for those who are working with Kairos. It is true for people who were working with folks in India when we could go there. Uh -huh. Second church families, and we're only engaging there 10 days out of the year. How, how could that yeah. possibly be? And it's just the way it works. Again, this is two-sided or two-fold in a sense the impact that that then has on us as well. Mm -hmm. It's truly transformative. And so even that oh. bit, so the supporting, the going, we can split those and then we can talk about the staying and the importance of being here. And we'll talk about that over this yeah. month and the work we do here as well in our communities. So all of that, it all matters. You know, I've just seen an aspect of that in short-term mission trips through GC Youth. I've been, mm -hmm. I've helped to lead our trips for the last several years, and we have been traveling to New Orleans over the last yes. three years. And um, just the the relationships that we mm -hmm. have developed there, and how I see these mission trip opportunities, and this goes with whether it's domestic or international, yeah. of the the life changing effect that yes. can have on students. And I even was talking with a couple students recently who are hoping to sign up for our mission trip and I was having a conversation with them and hearing from them that one of the things that they were excited about for this trip is to learn from it, to learn more about sharing their faith and to take that here, That's which awesome. is just amazing to yeah. me because yes. that is what we try, the vision we try to cast for students. but. I haven't heard as many say that on the front end to me when I asked them, yes. why do you want to go? I hadn't heard that too often, yeah. but I heard that from a couple students actually this week that I was talking to who were saying that why they want to go is they want to learn, how can I do this at my home? I want to do this better here. And I just feel like this is an opportunity that's going to force yes. me to do it, pull me out of my comfort zone in a way that will help equip me to do it here, which is just incredible. Yes. And so that's part of the reason why we do love Love missions, month. Love this stuff. One hundred percent. This focus on yeah, and it's missions. you know again to to my earlier point. It's amazing to me when I hear you and Rocky, who's our youth leader here at Grace Chapel, mm -hmm. if you uh, are connected with Grace Chapel and others who've been on that particular trip. When I hear you all talk about the church planter, the mission leader, there's a name, Just, Justin. Justin. So, yeah. so I mean, like I know this guy's name, yeah. <laughs> and I've never been, but the yeah. way you guys talk about him, there is a deep connection mm -hmm, that has mm -hmm. been developed there. And it's like every time you talk about him, I feel like I should know him. Yeah. <laughs> and and those kind of things just, again, they shouldn't be possible, except they are through what God does. And yeah. so for us to not value both these experiences, that's the going, and then the supporting when we raise this money and help other, it, it, it would be a miss on our part. Mm -hmm. And so I think, mm -hmm. yes, we do what we do here and let's do that even better. Let's lean into it more fully, but let's never think about stopping and giving up the things that we're doing to support that's and good. to go to other places. So in this missions month at Grace Chapel, we'll spend some time. Uh, we're gonna we'll have Mission Sunday. We're gonna take that mm -hmm. contribution that we're gonna use to help support that work. That's right. We'll spend some time thinking about hearing some stories from some of the mission work that we're doing. Some of the That's videos, right. yep. and so, uh, showing some videos from a couple of these places mm -hmm. and some of that work that's going on. And also the message series this month is going to yeah. complement that, right? So right. we're going to go into this series called I Will Love that That's we're right. going to be in yep. for this month about loving the mission, loving. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually four different things right. we're going to talk about mm -hmm. loving. You want to give us a little overview of where yeah, this series is going. Um, and then we're going to talk about this week's message for a few minutes before we wrap up. Yeah, so we're just going to split this into four sets, basically, um, and, and we're going to talk about 
it is called I Will Love. And, and in this, we're actually going to raise this kind of a uh, little bit of attention is, you know, we throw the word love around. And there are some things we talk about that we love or that we say that we love that maybe and sometimes I'm like, should I really say I love? Well, I mean, pizza doesn't love me so well. But, you know, so I was going to use the idea of pizza because sometimes you know, I've heard others say that. You know, for me, let's just say I, I love Thai food, right? Oh. I love Thai food. Do I really love Thai so, food, or is it just that I really enjoy Thai? It's so good, right? Yeah, it's yeah. really good. Um, I want some Thai food oh, right now. <laughs> Killer Thai restaurant here in town too. That's really great to go man. to, and uh, man, the flavors are just so good. And so I could sit here and describe that and talk about I love it, um, but really, I'm not talking about loving it. Yeah. I'm talking about man, I really enjoyed the food and even the experience of mm-hmm, it, and mm-hmm. all the flavors that kind of overlap and weave together and then the fact that they will often tailor the spice level to where it is complementary to I mean so I could talk about all that oh. and it's, yeah I know I, it's so unfair to all of you who are probably driving somewhere <laughs> listening to this podcast right now and I'm really the day sorry, this comes not out, sorry. sales of Thai food are a spike <laughs> in coming <laughs> that's right you're welcome Thai food restaurants so um, you know do we really love that I don't know you know, so I, I would want to say, like, when somebody's saying that, there are times that I want to say, but do you really, do you really love that? And then on the flip side of that, there are some things in life that we should love that we probably don't love. Mm-hmm. And I know for some, when we talk about the idea of loving the gospel, that's where we're going to begin this week, or when we go on to talking about loving the mission, we're going to have a little bit of tension there. It's not going to be nearly as much when we get to the third week, which is our Missions Giving Sunday, which is, I think, the 19th, if mm-hmm. I uh, remember well. That. So the 19th of March um, will be our Giving Sunday. What we're going to be talking about, I love my neighbor. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to end with, I love this world. Yeah. And those are a lot easier because Jesus talked about loving neighbor. And Jesus talked about loving the world, or, or at least we know that Jesus did love the world. Um, in the sense that, you know, John tells us, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his mm-hmm. only son, right? So we can see those, but the idea of loving gospel, loving mission is probably going to create a little bit of tension for some folks, but, but that's okay, yeah, you well, know, and, and, and I want people to love yeah. the gospel and the mission, and so we're going we're gonna to work toward that. I think there's some interesting, like, this, there are a few questions or a few mm-hmm. implications, I guess, maybe that are built into mm-hmm. that title. First off is that I will love. It. There, there is an implication that this series is for disciples of Jesus, right? Yeah. Of like, there are some some series, some messages yeah. where we are, maybe it's more geared towards someone who's maybe new to faith. That This is something that like we're saying, if you're a disciple of Jesus, this is something that you should love. You should love the um, gospel. And then there's that question in there is that if you say you don't love it, yes, uh, there's a call to this is something that you should that you should love. Yes. So hopefully this is challenging to you yeah. as we go through this, um, as we work our way through this series. Mm-hmm. I'm actually excited that in, in next week's podcast, uh, I will be yes. sharing the message. That's right. So, so we get to flip. The we're going to be That's flipping right. these chairs. Yes. Yep. Uh, so that'll be yep. exciting. Talking about loving the mission, but. For this week, this week's message, where we'll be focusing is on I will love the gospel. I'll yeah. love the gospel. So you want to give us a little overview of this week's message, um, yeah. what, we, <clears throat> what yes. we're discussing. Yeah, so I already kind of you know raised the tension a little bit um, as it relates to you know at least a couple of pieces within this series. Can I love something like the gospel? Can I love something like the mission? And what I want to say is the answer to that is yes, we can. In fact, I want to say... You know, um, we there are things again that that we that do, do deserve our love mm-hmm. that we probably don't love or love de- nearly deeply enough. And in fact, that you know that's an idea. You know, as I was kind of mulling through this, I mean, it led me to kind of remembering, uh, you know, this guy. You can call him Augustine or Augustine, depending on how fancy you want to be in the way you pronounce his name, I guess. Um, you know, if you want to sound really scholarly, you, you put a short eye on that, and it's Augustine. You know, and that makes you sound like you really know what you're talking about, I guess. But, uh, you know, so Augustine talked about, or Augustine, talked about um, disordered loves. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of the point that he made in that is the problem that you and I have and that others have is not typically, now, again, generalities. It's not typically that we love the wrong things, especially those of us who are followers of Jesus, right? 
it's not that we typically love the wrong things. It's that we don't love the right things in the right order. Mm. You know, so it's not that you shouldn't love your family. It's not that you, I mean, Jesus didn't mean for us to not love our families. Of course he wants us to love our families, but we, he wants us to love our families in the right order. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not that you shouldn't love your wife, but you should love your spouse in the right order. It's not that you shouldn't, in a sense, even love your own life, and that's going to lead us to one of the verses that we're going to talk about this Sunday, um, or that you know, we will have talked about um, by the time this podcast released releases, um, is not that we shouldn't have a measure of love for our own life, but we need to love our own life in the right order. <laughs> you know, it's not that we shouldn't love others. We absolutely should, but we need to love others in the right order. And and it's say, absolutely that we love God and we love Him in the right yeah. order. So, yeah. well, and probably for most of our listeners mm-hmm. um, here would say that they do love the gospel. Um, I would imagine most of our listeners would probably agree if if you're calling yourself, if you're a follower of Jesus would probably agree with that. But mm-hmm. with that line of thinking, do we love that in the right order? Right, um, and that's where that would become convicting to me is do yes. I am I always loving that in the right order? Am I putting the gospel above these other right. loves? Because love is a word, I think, man, that we make just do a lot of work yeah, in American yeah. life, yes, as you already yes. articulated, right? We yes. use the same word to discuss your relationship with your significant other and to discuss your relationship and with Taylor Thai word. New pop single. Like that, well, okay, Paul, that's that's a high love for me. Um, <laughs> low low blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ben, I could not resist. No, thank you. Thank you for resist. that. Yeah, but it just it, yeah. it's a word that we're making do a yeah. whole lot of work. Agreed. Talk about our relationship with Jesus and my relationship with Taylor Swift's music. Yes, we're making that word do probably too much. It probably yes. should be a, a couple words, as it is in other languages. But I think it's going to be an ongoing tension <laughs> and an ongoing lament um, for certain uh, as it relates to the amount of work that we ask the word love to do. In that yeah. sense, yeah, I, I agree. Um, let me just make a case. If there is somebody out there saying, but can, can I really love the gospel? I mean, you know, I, yes, I love Jesus, I love God, but is the gospel really something okay. I can love? Yeah. Um, and I want you to see that Jesus puts himself and the gospel and our life, he packages it in, in the same sentence, mm-hmm. basically, mm-hmm. Um, in Mark 8, 34, 35. You know, this is what he says. He says, he, so... Mark says, Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And we see this in is it Luke 10 and Matthew 9 as well. A similar, similar uh, scene. But in this particular recording of this scene, and you know, most scholars believe that Mark was written first um, and that Mark was probably source material for Luke. And we're not 100% sure about Matthew. Matthew may as the chosen. We talked about this the other day. You know, as pictured in the chosen, mm-hmm. been a scribe who was along there. You know, the tax collector, so obviously knew how to write, read all that stuff. So maybe he was taking down memories of what was happening with Jesus. And so, we don't know. We don't know. But there is, for a lot of good reason, speculation that Mark's gospel is probably first, and that Mark's gospel was also Peter probably dictating to mm-hmm. Mark, who was mm-hmm. then writing these things down. And so maybe Peter's he's recalling, and of course the Holy Spirit inspiring that and working and making all this come together. Um, here's how Mark records this particular scene. And we're familiar with the first part, the whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. That's verse 34, okay? So we know that, you know, I mean, Luke actually says, um, I think Luke 9, Luke 9 actually, and it's Matthew 10. Luke 9, I think Luke, Luke says, you know, you take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me. Mm-hmm. So it's a daily take up. So each one of these guys has has something extra that's added that brings an extra facet into what Jesus was saying. And it's highly possible that Jesus said this multiple times and said it multiple different ways because he was, after all, a rabbi and a preacher and a teacher. So he went around saying very similar things in lots of different locations to different crowds. And so what was recorded here may have been a different time. So Jesus is what, what Jesus says here is significant. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Now listen to this last part. But whoever loses their life for me, oh yeah, that makes sense. We lose our life for Jesus. Well, why would I lose my life for Jesus? 
because my loves are ordered correctly. Mm. I love Jesus more than I love my life, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that would be the assumption. And it's easy to make that jump logically, even maybe emotionally, when we're talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But then he says this next. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel yeah. will save it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus says we both may be called to lose our life for him and for the gospel. And, and then the reality of that is Jesus is talking about giving up our lives, which sometimes means giving your life, and at other times means giving your life. Let me explain what I mean by that. I mean, yeah. sometimes yeah. we yeah. might, sometimes we're called to die for something. Mm -hmm. And if we're not called to die for something, we're still always called to live for it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. We, we only die for something because we're living for it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're all called to live for it, and some may be called to die for it as well. But Jesus says, not just for me, but also for the gospel. And so there is this reality that we're being called to, I mean, we make that jump easily when we say, okay, the reason I would give my life for Jesus is because I love Jesus more than I love my life. Do you love the gospel, the good news of Jesus? Which that means we're actively not just pledging allegiance to Jesus, but we're out there engaging. It's evident that, I mean, how do you lose your life for the gospel? I mean, what is the gospel? Yeah. It's the good news about Jesus. What do we do with the good news about Jesus? We tell other people. Yeah. And so the act of telling and sharing the gospel, and of course we share the gospel because we love people, but we mm -hmm. also love the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, Jesus I think is pointing out, I mean, what he's really doing is exposing one in this passage. If we're true to this passage, he's exposing the fact that we love our lives. We really do. Like, I love my life. That would be a reason I might not lose my life because I love my life too yeah. much. Yeah. Right? Or I love my comfort. Or I might not want to give up some things because I love my current friend group. Or mm -hmm. I might not want to give up, you know, the house that I love. And you know, all it is, the things that make my life my life. I really love these things. And Jesus is saying, would you consider whether you love me, but not just me, the gospel more than all these things that make up your life as it is? And so I think there's a genuine call to love the gospel. Or as we will have touched on on Sunday as well, um, this, I mean, the Apostle Paul, for the Apostle Paul in Romans 1.16 to boldly state I am not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there would have been some reason then apparently to be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul says, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I love the gospel so much, I will not be ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. I value the gospel. If that's an easier word for you, the gospel matters so much. It is so important. I love it. I love it so well that I will not be ashamed of the gospel. You know, all these things point us, I think, to this place where we ought to be able to con conclude that Jesus is calling us to love him and love the gospel. And the Apostle Paul is saying, guess what? I do, I do love the gospel. Mm. And where we ought to be at a place where we're saying the good yeah. news of Jesus. That's good. One, because it's changed me so much. It's transformed me. Mm -hmm. At a place where there was only bad news in my life, I got this good news. It transformed me. And that I believe it will do the same for others as well. Therefore, man, I flat out, I love the gospel. Mm -hmm. you know, so unapologetically. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that, that we're being called into, to, to be those kind of people who love the good news of the gospel. And that's the foundation of where we start this month, is loving the good news about Jesus so much that we would give our life for it if we were called to, but so much that we're going to always live our life for it if that's never what we're called to do is in giving our life. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we are, we wanted to spend some time talking about Missions Month and what the heart of this is all mm -hmm. about. So we're spending a little less time today discussing the actual message yeah. itself, but we do want to still land on our weekly question yes. of how do we practice this? How do we practice yes. what we're talking about today to be faithful to Jesus? Yeah, well, if, if you're a Grace Chapel member, if you're connected with our community here, um, you're going to be listening to this most likely on the back end of hearing a message where I will very boldly say, hey, what we're challenging our folks to do is on this particular Sunday, give in a way that you know is going to make a difference. And if you can do it, 
five times your typical giving is what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we'd love to see our community raise more than $100,000 again this yeah. year yeah. for the sake of supporting missions. Um, I think as it relates to just maybe this particular message, if we could get back to that idea, uh, the, you know, Augustine's idea of disordered loves, to examine our loves, um, because I think that's where we start. That's the foundation for where we're going to move the rest of this month. So we love the gospel. We love the mission. We love our neighbor. We love the world. Who stands in the way of me loving the gospel, my neighbor, the world, the mission of Jesus well? It's me. It's me. It's my life. So I am often subject to disordered loves, the victim in a sense yep. of disordered loves. And because I'm the victim of disordered loves, others around me become the victim of my disordered loves. Mm -hmm. So I think first, you know, just a, a practice in that, examine your loves. Mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe to use Augustine's, not necessarily his words, but his thought pattern. Um, let me just say this, and this is what I will have said on Sunday morning, is that loving the gospel is a choice to love the right thing. Loving the gospel deeply is choosing to love in the right order. So I think, you know, I hope that's something that will really compel people to think, stop and think, do I love the gospel? If I don't, or if I do, is my love for the gospel disordered, misordered? And if it is disordered, is it because I love my life too much and I need to learn to love the gospel more? So I, I think that's what I'll leave us with. That's good. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Paul. We hope you'll take some time to reflect on that this week and to uh, just spend some time reflecting and meditating on that. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to continue moving forward uh, with this idea. Next week, I will be sharing the message on mm -hmm. this love for the mission. So we'll continue this conversation in that way. We invite mm -hmm. y'all to join to us again for that. And uh, until then, God bless. Thank you for joining us.